Good evening and welcome to Film 74. And that energetic bloke was, of course, Bruce Lee, arch exponent of the art of Kung Fu and various other aggressive oriental pastimes. I'll be reviewing his new and, alas, last film in a moment, but the major part of tonight's programme will be devoted to an interview with Rod Steiger. I am uh, trying to be an actor. What I want is the same thing I wanted when I began, was a good part. I get paid more now, which I enjoy. I like good food and wine and a nice house to live in. Uh, but the problem hasn't uh, changed. I will go to any castle in quotation marks and perform for any uh, court in quotation marks that they'll let the, the players play, so to speak. A somewhat remodeled and slenderized Mr. Steiger, as you may have noticed. More from him, however, later on. For now, let's go back to Bruce Lee, the man who was becoming something of a cult until his untimely and rather mysterious death last year at the age of 32. Enter the Dragon was his last film, and in many ways his best, in that, for a change, the plot at least made some kind of sense. Lee plays a sort of chop-suey James Bond, who sets out to unmask and destroy a master criminal who conceals his villainous activities behind a martial arts academy. You don't really need to know much more than that, except the, the fights are as frequent and as violent and as superbly staged as ever. Nobody, I think, could accuse Bruce Lee of being an actor, but he had an engaging personality, and he certainly knew how to create excitement on the screen. done by mirrors of course a last look at the unlucky bruce lee and after that easternized western or westernized eastern another curiosity the day of the dolphin is a most peculiar film made by mike nichols director of the graduate and who's afraid of virginia wolf it has george c scott as a scientist who rears a young dolphin from birth and teaches it to speak english but onto this absorbing and essentially disney-esque situation is tacked a thick-eared and complicated plot about a bunch of villains who want to steal the dolphin and its mate and use them for nefarious purposes as underwater mine carriers. That's not as daft as it sounds, because I believe that, to its eternal shame, the American Navy has already tried it. The scenes with the dolphins are quite fascinating, but the human beings tend to get in the way a bit, with the exception of George Scott, whose acting is never less than distinguished. There is a shark in this tank. Son of a bitch, I told you there's no hyper... I don't know whether it's actually possible to teach dolphins to declare undying love, 
but I shouldn't be at all surprised when you consider that as a species they once emerged onto the land, took a quick look round and beat it back to the sea again, you realise they're a good deal smarter than we are. And if what Mike Nichols is saying is that we should leave them alone before we make their existence as dangerous and messy as our own, then I'm with him. Good, Fa, good. No shark here. No shark. No shark. What, uh, what, what is it? What is that? He's calling you a liar. But now, by way of total contrast, swastika. Philippe Mora's reconstruction through newsreels, propaganda films, and Ava Brown's old home movies of Hitler's comparatively brief but not uneventful reign as Chancellor of Germany. Much the most interesting material is provided by the home movies, taken at Berchtesgarten, where Ava and Adolf and the boys, Goering, Himmler, Goebbels, and the rest of the Merry Men, used to relax and romp around. Well, the others relaxed, but... Hitler never seemed to stop strutting about and striking attitudes, as a change, I suppose, from striking Jews. It's a curious film because, for the most part, Hitler is shown as a rather lovable fellow who may have made a few mistakes but was kind to animals and children. It's only at the end, with brief shots of Jew baiting, war, the devastation of Berlin and the unbelievable horror of Belsen, that the less appealing side of his personality is revealed. Even so, when you look at that tight, mean little face with its preposterous moustache, it's hard to see how the Germans ever took him seriously. Just observe him here with Ava at Berchtesgaden. Me now is kind to me. Love has opened my eyes. Since it came to me, life again to me with the sweetest surprise. I never knew how good it was to be a slave to one who means the world. A rather romanticised view of a remarkable monster, one whose infamy overshadowed even that of his contemporary dictator Benito Mussolini, a man with a pretty terrifying track record of his own. Rod Steiger's just finished playing Mussolini in a film about the last few days of his life. Shortly before he began filming in Rome, I talked to Steiger about his own life and career. We met beside what I suppose one might call Mussolini's needle, the phallic symbol of an obelisk that was built by the fascist youth movement and is Rome's only remaining monument to Il Duce. From there we went into the stadium that Mussolini constructed for the Olympic Games of 1940, games which of course never took place because the world was otherwise engaged at the time. One of the reasons I'm here to do Mussolini is that the... because uh, I think it's an adventure to try to explore this man because in my, my part of the world, or like in America, I don't know what my part of the world is, I don't know what the world is, but anyway, the point is that... Uh, we only th have a picture of him as a uh, rather bad uh, buffoon or a clown, uh, which is obviously not accurate, even though, unfortunately, that may be the image that he left. And uh, so for me, because I like to make acting in some form of uh, adventure, uh, this is a chance for me to explore uh, in front of the public, I guess, because I'm going to be in photograph while I'm trying to explore the character of a person which has been more or less uh, not too easy to define. Prima di procedere alla premiazione. He's been called greedy, and he's been called kind, he's been called wrathful, and he's been called uh, disgusting and genteel, and nobody seems to know really what he was the most contradictory character and therefore a challenge for me and therefore an adventure in acting and uh, that's why we're sitting here one of the reasons we're sitting here and talking and we're looking into that thing and not moving too much as i was told <laughs> but he was also of course a very bad actor wasn't he so you've got to portray a bad well actor. that's what i said i said you know like a joke in quotation marks he said would, would you like to do mussolini and i said well uh, I don't know how good an actor I am. I said, but how do you do a man who was such a bad actor, at least in his public life? And that's going to be the problem. And also there's uh, political connotations on both sides, which uh, I know I will never satisfy, which is not my responsibility in this particular incident, instance. And 
no matter what kind of a Mussolini, like when I did Napoleon, there are going to be people who say, no, that's not Mussolini. Like there were people who say, no, that's not my Napoleon. Why is it always Wellington? Wellington, 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 Wellington. Why are you all so afraid of Wellington? Is it because he beat you in Spain? Is that why? France will not follow you. France will follow me to the stars if I give her another victory. You have no choice. You have to give up the throne. <laughs> oh, nay, nay, nay. The throne... Do you know what the throne is, nay? The throne is an over-decorated piece of furniture. It's what's behind the throne that counts. My brains, my ambitions, my desires, my hope, my imagination, and above all, my will. I can't believe my ears. You all stand before me waving a piece of paper, crying, abdicate, abdicate. I will not! I will not! Not! Well, do you come out of it feeling that it's your Napoleon that you did and it's likely to be your Mussolini? Will you be happy with it, do you think? I, well, I can only give the... I will try to make it... Uh, to become a part of the man's life as much as I can in acting terms and do it the way I see it. Uh, unfortunately, in some respects, uh, like in uh, Waterloo, uh, I wasn't around to do a lot of the editing, which can change the... Uh, I thought Waterloo was... Uh, became more cannons than human beings. What's he doing? What's Nay doing? What's happening? Can I leave the field for a minute? What's he doing there? How can a man go forward with the cavalry without infantry support? What's the matter with you? my impression of a person or my impression of a world or and that I think is a basic thing in art is one man's uh, conception you, you are to you know if you want to agree with it or not that's up to you but he, he, isn't there a danger that you're going to show him as uh, too sympathetic a character because he was rather pathetic at the end of his life well yeah I'm doing the last four days so I'm not doing the life the last four days he is a pathetic disillusioned sometimes furious but dying, uh, rather agonized human being. And that's why we have tried, we're going to try through the use of newsreels of that to show the other side of him. I'm sure there, there are some scenes where he will be, uh, you will feel sorry for him. That's not the intention of the picture, to exonerate him or protest uh, his innocence. But I hope not too much. We're going to try to keep a balance. But by, by way of a complete contrast to that, you're also in another film, which is which is opening shortly, called Lucky Luciano, um, in which you're playing, what, a, a guest, guest spot? Well, no, I have a friend of mine, Franco Rosi, who I think is one of the nicest men, one of the best directors in Italy, and uh, there was a part of an Italian-American gangster, a guy from New York, and uh, he asked me, he called me, he said, Rod, would you do this because this you could do, and... Uh, That's just a small part, isn't it? Yeah, it's like a cameo, I guess you'd call it. Uh, that's the... Uh, <laughs> a cameo is the... Uh, I guess the actor's way of hiding his pride, saying uh, it's not a small part, it's a cameo. <laughs> but... Uh, but you don't strike me as a man who's ever been terribly concerned about his, his image as an actor. Well, no, I don't have an... Im I don't think an actor's supposed to have an image. I was brought up in the theatre, and I was brought up in the tradition of an actor. I'm in the tradition of the of a Muni, I don't, that was my ideal type of actor, or a Harry Bauer, the French actor, my ideal, or Ray Mou, an actor who created different parts, and therefore, uh, when I first heard the word, when somebody said to me once, that'll be bad for your images, I don't know what the hell you're talking about, because I'm supposed to create, or I believe, try to create different people, different characters, different personalities, therefore the images, to have an image to me would be death as an actor, would be monotonous.
listen to me. Just once in my life, I'm going to hold my temper. I'm telling you that you're going to stay here. You're going to stay here if I have to go inside and call your chief of police and have him remind you of what he told you to do. But I don't think I have to do that, you see. No, because you're so damn smart. You're smarter than any white man. You're just going to stay here and show us all. You got such a big head that you could never live with yourself unless you could put us all to shame. You want to know something, Virgil? I don't think that you could let an opportunity like that pass by. How'd you get my number? Oh, my sweetheart, how many Mars crumbles are in the phone store? What do you want? Oh, Morris, I have been a bad boy again. Yes? Yes. But what do you mean, yes? Just don't say yes. Show some interest. Can't you notice my voice is completely different? Yes, I noticed that. All right. <laughs> you should have heard my father, McDowell. It was sensational. <laughs> don't you think I'm clever? Yeah, you're a wizard. Thank you. You should, you should hear my WC feel sometimes. It's absolutely uncanny. <laughs> my boy! engage in a conversation with the great W.C. Field himself concerning degeneracy, debauchery, and murder involving on the case one infantile detective called Morris Brummel Boy Detective. You like that one, Morris? <laughs> If this were a movie, you'd have been on the floor ten times. It's just a small token. I'll break you. I'll break you like I... No. <laughs> no, no. No, no. I'll let the law do it for me. I'll let the law do it for me this time. And you lose everything. You lose everything. This is the scandal and a disaster and a ruin. The dead child's family and the insurance company will take everything off your back in any court in the land. Close off your back, off your child's, and off that woman's. Everything goes, child. Everything goes. The house goes. The paintings go. And you, oh, you go. Do you find now that it's getting harder to find the kind of parts you want to play or the kind of movies that uh, you Yes, want I to think, be in. yes, because we went through, uh, you see, first place, I don't know about the, I can't talk about the English cinema, but uh, in America, what happened, Madison Avenue Mine moved into the art of cinema, and they found the youth market, and then they begin to exploit that until uh, anybody who was uh, over 13 was too old to get in pictures anymore. Then they wore that out, and then they discovered, rather belatedly, they discovered uh, sex, which came to them as a big surprise, but, <laughs> but they discovered in a, in a degrading form. I mean, uh, in a, uh, I'm not I'm talking about pornographic, because a good pornography is a nice thing, and I get a kick out of it, and I like it in its proper place. And uh, also the sexual aspects of life. But they begin to use it, they exploit it, and therefore demean it. And now that, what I call the age of voyeurism, is kind of passing out of movies, because now everybody knows how they're built between their legs, and they've seen all the positions, and they're a little tired, and they say, we'd like to get back to life and what life is about. So I think now there's a hope for material to return, more adult material for people who still take uh, acting serious. I like to think they're serious about acting. And, of course, after the, uh, <clears throat> the discovery of sex in the movies, they've now discovered violence. And that, too, isn't really well, a scene, I, is it? Uh, violence is obviously a product of animal ignorance, uh, certainly ignorance, with the highest form of animal, that's why I use for that word. And since uh, the arts supposedly reflect the society we exist in, and our society begins to try to solve things through uh, violence rather than through debate or rather through uh, educational uh, ways. Uh, it showed up in our films, uh, blow them up, destroy them. Uh, I find most of these films, I don't want to mention films because it's unprofessional, but a lot of the films degrade uh, both of the sexes and destroy them at will according to the, almost to the clock. You know, if it's a 90 minutes, the picture should be 90 minutes, blow them all up. There they go, that's <laughs> the end of the picture. Next week, East Lynn, it's, uh, it's the way it goes. It doesn't, it doesn't help an actor who's more interested in, in characterization, does it? 
Well, no, because first place, uh, there seems to be... Uh, well, it's a funny, I never thought of it before, but if, if you're... There was good violence, there was good violence and bad violence. Uh, we had pictures made where people were really massacring people and had they been uh, Nazis in the picture, we would have been in an uproar about the film, but because they were the good guys, they were justified to disregard the law, ride in in a group, and wipe out people in the most bloody way imaginable the director could think to put on the screen. And we all sat back and said, that's good, which is a, violates one of the things I believe in, is that the annihilation of any human being for any reason is a crime, regardless how justified you may seem. You mentioned just now about actors being insecure, but doesn't this get better as you get older and wealthier and, and more famous? Basically, the, you feel more responsible as you get bigger parts, and then you be, feel more responsible for the overall film, mm. or at least you should. It's not just that you may do a good performance, uh, but you want the film to be good because your name is on it. I mean, if you make a mistake in the films, you make a mistake in front of the entire world, not just in your office, not just in your factory, not just in your block, not just in your village, but the whole world is going to see you looking like an idiot. And uh, if you're going to look like an idiot, I like to demand at least the privilege of knowing that I was the man who insisted on looking like an idiot, and it wasn't because of uh, people around me. Yeah. You know, and that's why sometimes you have to fight. And the minute you fight, they say, oh, he's difficult. And in America, when you say he's difficult, that's like the kiss of death, because they say, well, then he's difficult, he's egotistical, uh, he's this, he's that, and he wants to take over. No, you're fighting for the preservation of your life if you're an actor. That's my life. That's when I function best, unfortunately. I wish I functioned on, as fully in my private life as I do when I'm working, because I'm terrorized by failure, therefore I'm energized by this terror, and therefore I kind of operate on a psychopathic maximum, <laughs> you know, with a desperate hope that I'm going to discover something the world will remember. And that's really what it comes down to. It's no more than that, I guess, is to be remembered with a certain monogam of respect. Well, let's turn to a more personal note. You are looking 40, 50 pounds lighter than when I saw Yeah, I took off some weight. But I, uh, I went up to, a, God knows, 250 million pounds when I was doing uh, Napoleon. And uh, I just decided that while I'm still comparatively young, uh, time to do something about it. But Rod, uh, apart from <clears throat> losing weight, I gather, too, that you've had um, facial surgery. Was it a facelift? No, it wasn't a facelift, really. What it was when I lost weight, and then anyway, underneath the eyes, it got to be very baggy and that, and I decided to get rid of it. I don't, because well, I, as I've said, I don't, uh, I think if anything you can do to preserve yourself in this world, if you have the money, or mentally and physically, I mean, to keep yourself at your best, you should do, you know. Anything I can do to keep myself, especially as an actor, I mean, I'm not, uh, a glamorous figure, but I would like to uh, keep myself in condition and not to play grandfathers too soon. That would make me very upset. Though I know that's every actor's destiny and his greatest enemy, or all of ours, not only actors, uh, is the passage of time. But basically, you, every, I mean, I get amazed because when they talk about feminine vanity and masculine vanity, there's no such thing. There is vanity. <laughs> and men don't like to get old either, and they don't like to lose their hair either, any more than a woman likes to wrinkle or whatever happens. And uh, as I said before, if you can and afford it and do it, uh, then do it. Keep yourself looking as best you can for yourself, mm. never mind your profession. But there, isn't there a danger of losing some of the character in your face? By no, the, well, that's if you do uh, too uh, much. Yeah. No, I mean, that's I don't have job. any character anyway. I don't have the, I'm sitting on my character, I think, <laughs> at the moment. I but uh, no, because you can do an awful lot with makeup and things like that, depending on the character mm. you're playing. When you were living in London recently, you were leading a much more extrovert life, weren't you? You always feel that, that actors, particularly very famous actors like yourself, are constantly surrounded by companions. I think the ones who can do it do not need to have an entourage to remind them of it. And they really need to rest, to refurbish themselves, to get out into life as human beings so they can select from life the other things that bring to new characters they're trying to create. Mm -hmm. If you stay in the world of any world, in the world of literature only, of only with music people around you, only with theatrical people around you, finally you become like a partially plastic theatrical puppet, I think, no matter how uh, intelligent you are or how talented. This is something I notice, and one has to, this is another way of preparing to survive, preparing to try to 
create again someplace further on. Well, I didn't think anyone would accuse you of being a plastic theatrical puppet. No, but there's always a danger when you're tired of getting, in, yeah. you know, involved with the... Uh, when, you, uh, when you're tired, uh, flattery is very appealing, no matter how false the mouse that speaks it. Uh, and sometimes you uh, find yourself uh, winding up doing uh, things you never would have done. For instance, uh, like I, I find myself... I was all of a sudden playing in a lot of tennis tournaments, and I said, well, wait a minute, what am I... Because I was bored, I wanted to work, and uh, in a same strange way, it gave me a sense of satisfaction. Uh, at least you were seen again. It was the old ham thing. The player was playing only this time with a tennis racket. You know. Mr. Steiger, thank you very much. Well, thank you. you, thank you. And any noise you heard was on this microphone, supposedly <laughs> hidden, so you shouldn't see it because the wind was too strong. Excuse the change of the sun. We bid you good afternoon or good evening or good morning from BBC London. Thank you. Or Rome, actually. Rome. Terribly sorry about that. Terribly sorry. I think I'd better offer some explanation of those titillating posters. We've been taking a look at late-night entertainment in the cinema, and although by no means all of it is aimed at men in dirty raincoats, sex does keep rearing its ugly head. Incidentally, if, as I'm sure you are, you're all decent, clean-living people who think that sex is really quite nice, you may have wondered, as I have, where this idea comes from that sex has an ugly head. Well, now I know. It originates in sex movies, which nearly all seem to be based on the premise that sex is rather nasty and degrading. However, more of that in a moment. Late night movies can and often do have titles like Love Me, Love My Wife, School for Virgins, Sex Farm, Dead Sexy, or The Sexy Dozen. But they can also be films like War and Peace, Truffaut's L'Enfant Sauvage, Mankiewicz's All About Eve, and Serafian's Fragment of Fear. A lot of ordinary, respectable cinemas feature occasional late night showings of ordinary, respectable films. And recently there's been a trend towards special late night and even all night programs for insomniac movie buffs. That trend could now be here to stay, as Romain Hart of Islington's Screen on the Green explained. Since the television has closed down at 10.30, we've noticed a great increase in, in our late night business. We, we turn away almost as many people as we get in, and uh, business is really very much improved. And has it gone down again since they've increased the... Well, we, we've only had one night to find this out, but in fact it hasn't gone down, and hopefully the people that we've gained uh, will keep. Do you think, in fact, that the circuits could run the same kind of late-night films that you do here? No, I don't think that they could. I, I think that we, we go to a specialised audience, an audience of young people, and I think that the circuits are not appealing to that sort of audience, and so they can't. They, 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 uh, they have to play a different sort of thing altogether. The late-night cinema, everyone is young, and there's a wonderful atmosphere. Um, the audience reaction is tremendous. They, they appreciate everything that you do, and they, they join in if there's anything, any shouting to be done, they'll shout. And it's a really super atmosphere. Do you think that it would be possible for a cinema like yours to run late night shows out, out of London or in other districts of London? Well, I don't think that it's a thing you can do in the suburbs normally. I think possibly in town centres, um, where you have a sophisticated audience in university towns, but I think not as a general rule, no, it isn't possible. And on what basis do you select the films? Well, we tried uh, to find films that we couldn't play for seven days because they wouldn't be commercial enough. So we have a pretty wide area to go through with Bergner's, Pasolini's and Bunuel's and the whole spectrum of the cinema, really. 
Does that mean that you don't think that Bergman and Pasolini and Bunuel can run for seven days? Well, uh, recently they have made more commercial films and they can. They've proved they can run for seven days, but this is a very recent thing. It's only since Discreet Charm of the Bourgeoisie Bunuel that he has become much more generally commercial. But basically, on the whole, oh, they, certainly the earlier Bunuels, are not, one couldn't possibly show for seven days. And I think the same applies to most of the Bergmans, unless you run a very specialised cinema. But here we do try not to be specialised all the time. We try to follow the directors that are, that are popular at any given time. For instance, we're showing a, a lot of Truffaut films at the moment because of Day for Night, and we're finding it very, him very popular. In the same way, we're showing Walkabout because of Nick Rogue, his new film, Don't Look Now, is such a success. But I think people want to see the earlier films he made. I want a drink! Well, the others can't Quick, wait. stop him! Uh, We're getting uh, away! Uh, 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 We're English! English! Do you understand? This is Australia. Yes? Where is Adelaide? Oh, it's Kimba Water! Yamo Banga and me. Banyar Panere. Water. Drink. We want. Water to drink. You must understand. Anyone can understand that. We want to drink. I can't make it any simpler. Water to drink. The water hole has dried up. Where do they keep the water? Water! Go, 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 go. Gape, gape. Gape, bingen. Morka, morka, gape, bingen. Wabalem, jalcele, ma, gape. Gape, bingen. Gape, bingen. Gape, bingen. Gape, bingen. Walkabout is concerned with the adventures of a girl and her little brother, played by Jenny Agatha and Lucian John, who are lost in the Australian bush. It's also a parable about the destructive and souring effects of the pressures of modern life. Director Nicholas Rogue had earlier made a very interesting debut with Performance, which has also been revived for late night showing at the Paris Pullman. It stars James Fox as a killer on the run, both from the police and his gangster associates, who takes refuge in a strange house owned by a retired and reclusive pop singer played by Mick Jagger, or as he's described in the film, Old Rubber Lips. It's a weird and unusual story which attempts to say something about the sources and causes of violence in modern urban society. For me it didn't entirely work, but it did have a number of good and even startling moments. In this scene, James Fox has his first meeting with his new landlord, Old Rubber Lips. There's been a mistake. You can't have the room. What? It's not for rent. Wait a minute, the lady's just said... Hey, said... I don't tell her everything. My secretary. Got a lot of work to do. Got a lot of pressure. Yeah. No, I don't want it. <laughs> that carpet's 200 years old. It looks it. A valuable antique, is it? Listen, I've got to say goodbye now. But the thing is, Mr. Turner, I've got all my luggage, my stage gear. It's all coming here from the continent. Your what? My luggage, my juggling, you know, stuff. Why don't you go to a hotel? A hotel? You must be joking. Look, I need a... I need a bohemian atmosphere. I'm an artist, Mr. Turner. Like yourself. You juggle. Why not? Why, why not? Why not? The jongleur. It's the third oldest profession. You're a performer of natural magic. Well, I, I perform. I bet you do. I, I can tell by your vibrations. The what performance showed right away was that Nicholas Rogue has a distinctive and individual style. He's an ex-cameraman and as such understands better than most directors the importance of imagery. 
This is illustrated most vividly of all in his third and latest film, Don't Look Now, which is currently on release. It's based on a short story by Daphne du Maurier about premonition and mysticism. It's set mostly in Venice in the wintertime, stars Donald Sutherland and Julie Christie, and has been described as a masterpiece. I don't quite go along with that, but it's certainly a most vivid and original picture, and has quite properly been nominated in seven categories for next month's British Oscar Awards. The atmosphere is created with great skill and power from the very beginning, in this clip where Donald Sutherland has his first premonition of the disasters that are about to come. What's the matter? Nothing. I can't show you very much of Quiet Days in Clichy because either the dialogue or the action might easily bring a blush to the cheeks of people of delicate upbringing. But here's a moody bit in which the Henry Miller character, played by Paul Valjean, flat broke, hungry and fresh, if that's the word I want, from the bed of his latest whore, tramps the streets of Paris trying to find some food. <laughs> Before I talk to Mrs. Wistrich, there's one other film currently on show which was turned down by the British Board of Film Censors and given an ex-certificate by the GLC, and that's Blowout. It's directed by Marco Ferreri and was the great succès de scandale at last year's Cannes Film Festival. Briefly, it's the story of four men who decide to eat themselves to death. Actually, they do other things as well. And indeed, what Marcello Mastroianni finds to do with a girl and the manifold of his sports car hardly bears thinking about, although to be fair, she seemed to like it. The four men are played by Mastroianni, Michel Piccoli, Ugo Tognazzi and Philippe Noiret and the GLC's decision to give it a certificate caused the most enormous fuss from all the self-appointed guardians of our morals. 
To some extent, I can see their point. It's not exactly a pleasant film. Michel Piccoli farting himself to death, for instance, is not very edifying either to watch or hear, although it is rather funny. But what the protesters have overlooked, I think, is the fact that the film's underlying message is a very moral one. Blowout is outrageous, certainly, but it's also a satire on the consumer society, and it reflects a disturbing but interesting pessimism about human nature and human society at any time. In this clip, the men have been joined at one of their gargantuan meals by a sort of earth mother figure, played by Andrea Ferriol, a woman of staggering greed who is destined to out-eat them all. Rage, le rêve est devenu réalité. Une femme est là. L'institutrice. Tu vois qu'elle est venue. Eh oui, vous êtes tout ouais. Mais ça. Eh non, mais enfin, alors on coupe les amas. On femme, coupe les amas, oui, je t'en prie. Alors, vous invitez cette pauvre fille au mieux de vos trois putes. Je vais me coucher, je vais dormir, je vous une... laisse à votre Ce n'est pas une pute, c'est une femme. Je t'en prie. Bonsoir. La femme. Bonsoir. Vous venez On va faire des Non, non, j'allais juste oui. au salon. Quoi. Alors, on prend le Bruno. Comment ça se passait Oh, le beau gâteau oui, c'est Hugo qui l'a fait. C'est un très bon pâtissier. D'ailleurs, nous, nous travaillons tous sous sa direction ici. J'étais un, un peu gêné de vous voir tout à l'heure arriver parce que ils ont aussi invité trois autres filles que je ne connais pas du tout. Oui, je les ai aperçues. Elles ont l'air très sympathiques. Ah oui, vraiment Ça vous gêne pas de dîner avec elles ah Non, pourquoi Parce que... Enfin, je pense qu'elles sont des mœurs un peu libres, un peu légères. Oh, ben nous verrons bien. Oui. Oh. Qu'est-ce que c'est Bravo, Marcello. Bravo. Hein? C'est très beau, c'est un peu mélancolique. Non, non, elle trouve ça affreux. L'idéal, ce que... serait pouvoir continuer à manger comme ça indéfiniment. Bien sûr, ça serait magnifique. À toi la caille, à moi le coquelet. <coughs> Well, with me now, I have Mrs. Enid Wistrich, who, since May last year, has been the chairman of the GLC's film viewing board, and is therefore the monster responsible for unleashing films like Blowout and Quiet Days in Clichy on an innocent public. Mrs. Wistrich, I think the first question I'd like to ask is what sort of criteria you bring to bear when you are looking at a film which the British Board of Film Censors has rejected, and you are, are going to give a certificate to we're a film viewing board of 20 people, of which I'm the chairman, and we have very precise rules of management, which were agreed by the Greater London Council in 1965. Uh, the rules of management say that we must refuse a license to a film if, in our opinion, it would lead people, it would incite to crime, lead to public disorder, contravene the Race Relations Act, or have a tendency to deprave and corrupt people. And we have to interpret those um, four rules of management. Is that a, a rather narrower range of criteria than the, than the British Board of Film Censors has? British Board of Film Censors, um, I think, has to consider, first of all, the country at large. We're yeah. only considering London. But they also have to try and protect the film industry from outcry. And I think they take into consideration more what will offend and upset people than we do. Aren't you the sometimes used as a kind of court of appeal by people with smutty films who haven't got it through the regular censor and therefore think they might slip it through you into the cinema? Well, undoubtedly so. I, I think they do this. Uh, they think, well, perhaps London will give us a certificate and then after a while we can go back to the British Board of Film Censors and say, see, it, you know, it wasn't so bad after all. Will you now give us a certificate? And, and this sometimes does happen. But you're on your guard against that, I hope, all the time. Well, we can only take the films which come up to us. We can't say to them, don't use us as a court of appeal, although we do find it rather irritating. What are your own personal views on censorship? Because I remember that at the time you got this job, you very nearly torpedoed the whole thing by saying you didn't think censors were necessary or desirable. Um, well, I did give a personal view, which was that um, films should be put on the same basis as the theatre or the printed mm. word. They don't have a prior system of censorship. They have censorship in, in the sense that if they do something which contravenes the law, which is in this case the Obscene Publications Act, they can be prosecuted. And um, my personal view is that this method of control should be extended to the cinema and it would, be, uh, would remove the, the different treatment which the media get. Mm -hmm. and my council, in, in fact, has not been very happy about its role in censorship for some time. 
over a year ago, um, the, the last council asked the government if they would carry out an inquiry into film censorship, and the government refused. And now this council is carrying out its own inquiry. Can we uh, go back and talk about the two films we've just seen clips from, Blowout and uh, sure. Quiet Liz and Clichy? What were your personal reactions to those two pictures? What do you mean as a, as a licensing censor or as a, as a critic or human being? As a critic and human being. I see. Well, Blowout was a very serious film and I thought it was a film of, of bitterness and despair and it quite upset me and parts of it you know, were upsetting and, and quite shocking in many ways. Um, but it, it was trying to say something. I don't know if I received the message, but uh, that was very clear that it was a film of some seriousness and quality. Mm. And what about Quiet Days and Clichy? You couldn't actually say the same about that, could you? No, no. Quiet Days and Clichy, I think, was a romp. It, it was, it's, it's a sort of completely amoral story about randy young men, and I should think probably randy young men would enjoy watching it. <laughs> you know, mm. your decision to pass particularly blowout has mm. caused a great deal of fuss from perhaps predictable quarters. Does that upset you when, when people attack you for those decisions you've taken? Well, I mean, there are people who feel keenly and who do get very upset. And, and in fact, we've tried to, to take them into account by, in the case of Blowout and Clichy, asking that a notice should be put in the foyer of the cinema saying that some of the material in the film could upset some people, could be offensive to some people. And so I understand that. They do tend to react in a very uh, vindictive and venomous way. You, you do get this kind of letter, and, and uh, for my part, I, I try to understand that they've been upset, and this is their way of reacting. Do you think there are any circumstances, or what circumstances do you think there are, in which a film could actually be harmful, could cause people to do things which normally they wouldn't do? Films which induce mass hysteria, I think, and curiously enough, some films with things you know, like pop scenes, strobic lights, this kind of thing, um, I think could almost fall into that category. Certainly films, say, like the Nuremberg rallies. Um, films which desensitize people to torture or sadism would also, I think, come into that category. Um, and those films, to those films you wouldn't give a certificate, or you'd well, be very reluctant, presumably. Our board as a whole in the last year has been very reluctant to give certificates to films with a great deal of violence in them. The board's been very worried about this aspect. Mrs. Mm. Wistrich, thank you very much indeed. Okay, thank you. And now, just to uh, round things off, a sample of a very different kind of late-night movie. This Saturday, the National Film Theatre is running an all-night festival of rock and roll. Innocuous stuff, you might think. But in its time, even rock and roll has been held responsible for all society's ills. However, the picture is The Girl Can't Help It, the story's a comedy about a publicity man who tries to promote his girlfriend to movie stardom, the music is by Fats Domino and Eddie Cochran, and the stars are Tom Ewell and the late, unbelievable Jane Mansfield. Until next week, good night. Okay, Mr. Anthony, this is a take. <laughs> Darling, oh my darling, in that prison cell I'd be Thinking of the day that I'd get out and hold you close to me But what is it I always see? One rock, two rocks, three rocks, four rocks Rock pile dust is on my shoes I'm a guy just born to lose When I hear the siren blow I get those blues. Rock, rock, rock around the rock pile. Rock, rock, rock around the rock pile. Rock, rock, rock around the rock pile. That siren's got me crying. Two rocks, four rocks. They make more rocks. Shut my cell and lock me in. Never let me out again when I hear the siren blow. I get those rock, rock, rock around the rock pile, rock, rock, rock around the rock pile, blue.